All right. Yesterday at 3 o'clock, I hit the jet lag wall. And now I'm forced to present to you at 3 o'clock today. Isn't that poetic justice? So I know that many of you might be hitting the, the global travelers, might also be hitting the jet lag wall. So I will try my best to make this as entertaining as possible. I know I'm supposed to present on big data. Sorry, I'm presenting on open data. That's the first thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I have a presentation that focuses on the economic benefits of open data with some use case examples from my own experience, uh, largely working with my colleagues in OGP, the Open Government Partnership. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what is the value of data. We have talked about data as a currency, that it is a new digital economy. And I would tell you that data at rest has no value. Data is not an asset with value based on scarcity. There is no scarcity of data. There is no purpose in trying to hoard it to make sure you have the only copy, because I guarantee you do not. I can have a copy. You can have a copy. Two billion other people can have a copy. And when data is so redundant, there is no possible way of valuing it as a scarce asset. It's better to think about data like labor. It has productive value when it's put to use. It doesn't have value, necessarily, sitting on the sofa watching TV. But it has value when it gets out of the door and goes to work. The same is true for data. Data has productive value when it is utilized. Therefore, in our societies, there is a direct benefit from getting more of it out there faster. When governments collect data, they intrinsically add latency to utilization. They collect that data from us. I mean, we are all the ones who are generating this, this artifact from our activities, from our lives, from our productive activities. And when government collects it, they hold it for a period of time. And during that period of time, it is not creating productive use in society. For the, at large, it is creating productive use for a smaller minority of government people. Not to say that that's not productive, but it's not the maximum utilization that could be achieved. So in order to drive more value from data, we need to increase its utilization and decrease its latency. A little bit of history. I don't know if everybody knows the history. Does everybody know the history of open data? The slide says it began in 2008. It's not really true. It began in 2005 with the World Bank initiative called the Transparent Aid Initiative. TAI was designed to bring transparency to foreign aid donations to prevent other nations who are receiving foreign aid from sticking the money in Swiss bank accounts and Cayman Island repositories. The idea was, well, look how much transparency the internet is providing to everyday communication. Couldn't we use the same type of transparency to make foreign aid more accountable? Um, in 2006, a new young senator from Illinois read about the Transparent Aid Initiative and said, well, Boy, if we can make foreign aid more accountable and transparent, what about the US government? Couldn't we do that? Couldn't the US government be, become more transparent? And he proposed a data transparency bill, along with another senator from Tennessee. And when this young man was elected president in 2008, he turned to his campaign staff, his social networking genius, David Plouffe, and he said, David, see if you can't find a way for us to put up a data repository to make good on our pledges for better transparency and governance. And David turned to his whiz-bang campaign staff and said, we want to set up an open data repository. Does anybody know how to do that? And there was a former executive from Microsoft named Kevin Merritt who raised his hand and said, I know how to do that. We can do it. He later told me he had absolutely no idea what he was talking about, but he needed a job, and so he volunteered to do it. And he put together a company called Socrata, which was the world's first open data
catalog. Now, an open data catalog is very different than a traditional database. In a traditional database, it looks sort of like an Excel spreadsheet, right? But on a computer. And, or uh, I would say, um, an open office spreadsheet, since I'm a Linux user. Um, but an open data catalog is actually a catalog of files. They're extracts, a CSV file, a spreadsheet file, a PDF. So when you publish open data in a catalog, you're not publishing a database which you might search using an SQL query. You're publishing a flat file in a file system. Socrata was the first. Then came another small company from Latin America named Junar. And then came a company, uh, an open source organization, the Open uh, Data Institute in England and the Open Knowledge Foundation created CCAN. And then another group of folks took CCAN to the next level and created DCAN. There are now four major open data catalog repositories in the world. And open data is spreading. Because soon after the Obama administration started publishing open data, they created the Open Government Partnership. Eric and my colleague from Korea, we're all members of the Open Government Partnership. We represent the Private Sector Council in OGP. Today, there are 65 countries around the world which participate in OGP. These, it's sort of like a global compliance program for open governance. They, each country commits to specific national action plans for things like open budgeting, uh, Freedom of Information Acts, and open data programs. I tell you, it is one of the most exciting things that I have ever participated in. It's an example of soft power. It is a forum where different governments come together and talk about how to create open governance and open data. It's not perfect. Not everybody involved is a paradigm of openness. We have some countries in OGP, like Azerbaijan, which are sliding back a bit. But it's still a forum where people can talk about how to become better, how to learn from each other, what the economic benefits are. Some of the economic benefits are exemplified in this chart. This is a small company in Silicon Valley called Helios Exchange. And Helios Exchange provides an online marketplace for energy efficiency and building retrofits. They take open data published by building owners. In the United States, it's Energy Star data that describes the energy consumption patterns of these buildings. It matches those buildings up with contractors in the area who can provide energy retrofits, with banks that provide financing specifically for retrofits, and with an insurance contract that underwrites the risk premium that a contractor won't deliver on the efficiency gains they promise in their contract. This process lowers the transaction costs for retrofits, creates new market opportunities for contractors to find work, and increases economic opportunity all through open data. Another example is in New York. You know, most governments have requests for information processes, RFIs and RFPs. But RFIs and RFPs always assume that governments know what the problems are. And we know that governments don't always understand what the problems are. If you look at the RFP process, the government says, we know the problem. We're just looking for a good vendor out there who can provide a solution. What New York is doing, and this is a, um, the controller Stringer just announced this program. One, they've instituted a vendor ranking system for the first time in New York's history. New York City spends $17.5 billion a year in procurement across 50 different agencies that all have their own procurement systems that don't share any information other than a common process for procurement. They've just set up a vendor ranking system for the first time trying to evaluate the performance of vendors who do perform contracting for the city. They're now looking to transform the procurement system into an electronic system so that there won't be any longer any paper-based submissions or paper-based contracts. They're asking vendors to report through open data how uh, the performance of their contracts. And they're looking to make this entire system open through an open contracting standard that the World Bank has proposed called open contracting. This is an example from the city of Palo Alto, which is a very small, do you guys know where Palo Alto is? Very small city, very small, very wealthy city in Silicon Valley, 
where many of the billionaires from the industry live, Palo Alto has made an online inventory of many of their physical assets of their city in open data. In this case, they have cataloged all of the trees in their entire city. And they have, not only just by long lat, but also with a universal resource indicator, URI, which is like a URL for data. And that allows them to share with the public the inventory of their trees. And they're inviting the public to come and provide some examples of how the public uses these assets. They're going beyond trees. They're inventorying their stop signs, their park benches, their sewer pipes, all of the physical assets of the entire city and making this information available online. At IBM, um, we began working with OGP uh, over the summer as the Obama administration began preparing for the Africa Leaders Summit on August 4th through the 6th. And uh, we knew that there were eight countries from Africa that were members of OGP that were coming to Washington that didn't have really strong open data programs. And so we volunteered to host an open data jam to help these countries learn some best practices from different cities and different states in the United States to improve their open data programs. I'll tell you, I, I sort of naively assumed that if we could just bring these people together and share some best practices, they could jumpstart their open data programs. And it didn't really work out that way uh, because, of course, if you want to publish open data, you need to have data in the first place. And we learned quickly that the key inhibitor for open data in Africa was just a lack of data. They just don't have a lot of information about agricultural production, industrial production. Uh, a lot of information that we take for granted in Singapore and the United States are just not available in Africa. In the midst of our, of our workshop, our day-long event, there were 22 members from the delegation of Sierra Leone who all simultaneously had their cell phones vibrate with messages from British Airways notifying them that their flights back to Freetown had been canceled because of the Ebola outbreak. And, you know, Ebola broke out in West Africa in January, and in March, WHO said it was contained. But by late June, it appeared to have um, been uncontained. But still, by late July, early August, none of us really thought it was a significant issue. There were less than 1,000 cases. It didn't seem to be a, a big problem. We thought it could be contained. But in this event, it took over. I mean, the faces of the people in the room just dropped. And so we then switched our entire agenda to focus on what could we do with open data to help these countries deal with an epidemic that they were totally unprepared to deal with. Fortunately, we had a group of folks from IBM Research participating who jumped into action. Within two days, we put together a proposal to build uh, an online SMS-based messaging system for the government of Sierra Leone, which we deployed in 30 days. The system combines radio broadcasts or broadcasts from the government via radio and television and megaphone to the population. Um, you know, oftentimes in times of crises and panic, governments communicate to the population without really knowing, gee, how is that communication working? Is it helping? Is it hurting? So, for example, on July 31st, President Karoma, the president of Sierra Leone, announced to the public that Ebola was an enemy of the state. It's a pretty drastic thing to say. You know, if you have Ebola, you've now been declared an enemy of the state. There were already troops in the streets in Liberia rounding up people with suspected cases. And so we decided to provide a feedback loop to the government on the efficacy of their messages by setting up a call center, encouraging people to call in to tell the government how they felt about Ebola. We take that information and we send it to a text-based uh, so social sentiment analysis uh, computer. We have a big uh, cloud-based system in Nairobi. And we provide a heat map back to the government of anxiety and fear in the population 
resulting from the messages that are going out. We've had thousands of calls. We take calls in seven different languages and transcribe them to English and send the text out. It was a remarkable experience to put together this solution, I can tell you. Uh, working in West Africa is both extremely frustrating as well as extremely rewarding. Um, since then, we've gone further. We now have 11 programs in IBM um, working across our research divisions to try to help combat Ebola in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, and in Liberia. On the, 10th, on, the 10th, on the 18th of October, we hosted an Ebola Open Data Jam in New York to try to aggregate information about the disease from all the different disparate data sources that all the different aid agencies and NGOs working in the region were collecting but not sharing with each other. I asked CDC, WHO, World Bank, all these groups, hey guys, how are you communicating with each other? How are you sharing data back and forth? They said, data? <laughs> yeah. If you find some, let us know, <laughs> kind of thing, you know? I said, well, you know, aren't you putting together any data resources for this? We're flat out. We're doing everything we can to get gloves and medicine and, and gowns over there. We don't have time for data. And I said, well, you know, we have some resources in IBM. Would you mind if we chipped in? They said, no, go ahead. Now, that's what I thought naively at the time that we could do. Uh, but I soon learned from IBM Legal that this was not a really good idea that Legal didn't want me to do. Because Legal said, hey, Steve, this is OK, but how is this going to work exactly? You're going to bring volunteers, and they're going to scour data sources, and they're going to put them on an IBM website? Uh, who's going to verify the licenses of that data? Might you not be combining confidential sources? Might we not be sued? You know, and so long story short, uh, I had to totally disassociate IBM from this event because legal wouldn't allow me to host it. I couldn't even physically be there. I had to sign up IBM versus volunteers. And in doing so, I persuaded a small company in New York named New Civic to register a domain called EboladATA.org to set up what I call a people data website created by a community of people who are passionate about making a difference in the world, not owned by a government, not owned by a corporation, just owned by the people for the purpose of helping other people thousands of miles away. And we set up this site. We scoured thousands of data sources, and we collected them and put them together without regard to, we tried to do some license checking. We put them together. And one of the things we learned from doing this exercise is that there is an extraordinary paucity, a, a lack of really meaningful data describing healthcare capabilities in Africa. There are no effective inventories from any of the aid agencies on what the healthcare capabilities in these countries are. There's some basic data from the Ministry of Health about, and this is some of their data, about where hospital facilities are located. But they don't describe how many beds they have, what kinds of beds, what kinds of doctors, what the qualifications of the doctors are, what the qualifications of the nurses are, which beds are available, which beds are quarantine capable, which physicians are, are educated for quarantine. They don't describe any of that information. And so it's very hard to know how to react to a, an epidemic if you don't even know what kind of capabilities you have. So we began immediately after that event to begin to try to aggregate public and private sector information describing the healthcare facilities in these countries. And we're bringing this information together again on February 22nd in another Ebola Open Data Jam in four cities around the world, in New York, in Los Angeles, in London, and in Freetown, to, bring, to put together a comprehensive catalog of healthcare information across West Africa to help these countries become more aware of their own capabilities through open data. But we're not just doing it for the purpose of collecting this information in a form of data colonialism, in which a new repository will be set up in New York. We're working together with the government of Sierra Leone and in, Free and in Liberia to get, empower them with their own open data repositories so that this information can help West Africa 
learn how to collect and process open data better for themselves. Because we want these countries to become just as effective with open data as the United States and West Europe and Singapore and other nations. Africa is the most data poor of all the continents on the planet, but there is the opportunity today to leapfrog some of the, some of the trials and tribulations and mistakes that we've made in the West to go farther and to do things right the first time around. Now, as I said, one of the things we learned from this experience is it isn't just for governments to publish open data. People can publish open data, too, because the cost and complexity of creating open data repositories today is so low through cloud-based technology. You don't need to have a server. You don't need a, a database administrator. You don't need a maintenance staff. All you need is a cloud account in SoftLayer or Azure or anywhere you want. And that means that anybody can set up an open data repository for any purpose. And I'll give you an example of one that we're working on. There's a township outside of Cape Town called Kayatisha. There are 350,000 people who live in this township, and they have some of the worst sanitation you've ever seen anywhere on the planet. Only 46% of their toilets work. That means work. And when I say work, that means sort of work. And they're public toilets, you know, in these townships you might have a family that shares a room, and you might have a hundred families that share one toilet facility. 66% are damaged and 54% are unusable, and it takes six months for the government to figure out how to fix them. And I'll tell you what, if you have to go to the bathroom, six months is a really long time to wait. So we're working with um, a local nonprofit to set up a people database using SMS um, transmissions, because that's everybody in South Africa has a cell phone. It may not be a smartphone, it's a candy phone, but it can send an, an SMS message. We're allowing the people of this township to self-report when the toilets are broken, to self-report when the government has been informed, to self-report when a repair crew has showed up to fix it, to start to catalog the evidence of the social and political dysfunction which leads to these sanitation problems, to empower the people to self-govern their own situation. And I think that's the power of people data. Now, those are some great opportunities, but we also have some significant challenges ahead. We have a lot of open data in the world, which is open by name only, and we have a lot of license terms from a lot of cities and states and nations, which are highly restrictive, and frankly, Many of us private sector companies would never use their data ever. My lawyers tell me Palo Alto, which is, has a policy called open by default, has license terms which are so restrictive we would never use their data. And I suspect that might be true for many others, other countries and other states. For example, they don't warrant their data. They reserve the right to take their data down at any time. They tell you that if they get sued, you have to defend them in court. You have to defend them in court if they get sued. Yeah. We don't know where data comes from. A lot of cities publish the data without telling us where they got it, who's used it, and who's certified it for publication. We don't have effective data models that describe the data from one city that could be compared to another. Now, in the financial services industry, we have large data models which help us map uh, the data from different mortgage units in a bank. But we don't have data that helps us map how Parks and Recreations uses data in Chicago versus Singapore. And we don't have enough international agreements on how data should be transacted. I believe in the future we won't just have free trade agreements, we will have free trade data agreements in which nation states agree on how data will be compared and exchanged between the nations. Now a little bit about some of the things that we're doing at IBM. I know I'm running low on time, so I'm rushing a little bit. We are an open data solution provider. We are a very large open data consumer, except obviously from Palo Alto. And we are an open data publisher. 
I didn't want to be the guy that drives or that flies around the world and tells different countries how they should do their open data programs without knowing how to publish open data myself. So earlier this year, we had a request from the government of Austria if we would mind contributing some of our open data to an open data portal they were setting up where many different Austrian businesses would contribute. I jumped at the opportunity, immediately said yes, and created a local data governance council with a data governance process to inventory our data assets and to assess which of those assets could be published in the open, outside our firewall, for public consumption, for anyone to use for any purpose without any license terms whatsoever. I convened a group, cross-company, and we published four extremely boring data sets. It wasn't the data that mattered, it was the process. And we did so, and we told everybody, we told all of our competitors and all of our customers around the world because we hope that they will follow our example and that more corporations will themselves commit to open data programs to share the knowledge that they develop through their commercial activities with the rest of the world. We're also working very hard on developing open data standards. I'm the co-chair of a W3C working group on open data best practices. We're developing vocabularies for data quality, for data comparability, and best practices in publishing. And we're just about to publish our first draft. I personally have seen open data is one of the most remarkable innovations I have ever seen in my 20-year career at IBM, coming from one of the most amazing and least, it's one of the most unexpected sources you would ever expect such an innovation to come from. Who would have thought that government would have come up with this idea? But it is, and it's transforming governments. It's outsourcing and changing the relationship between government and IT and the people and corporations. And I think we're just at the cusp of a remarkable transformation of the way we collect and publish information around the world. We have a lot of challenges, but there's a huge amount of growth that we can all contribute by increasing utilization and reducing latency. I've included at the back here some references, some articles that I've published on open data. If you'd like to read more, uh, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Steve, for, for casting a, a sharp focus on open data, which is clearly a very important dimension to make big data work for all of us. Can I invite um, uh, questions and comments from, from the round table? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, to uh, uh, to yes, uh, comment on that question. So uh, some data, uh, uh, as, uh, you, uh, as, you, uh, as you say, is free. So, uh, so operational data, what transaction data, uh, they are uh, byproduct. So you can say, uh, you can think uh, it is uh, free, uh, value is very low, but some data are very uh, expensive uh, to make. Uh, for instance, uh, indoor, indoor map, Mm -hmm. or a uh, uh, three-dimensional map. Uh, such, ma such data uh, is very critical to uh, creating uh, smart services. Uh, so someone uh, anyway spend big money uh, to uh, create data. Yes. Uh, so it's so just a comment. So, and uh, the other uh, comment is that when uh, government open uh, its data, there are uh, two difficult things. Uh, the, 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 the government, uh, the, there, there are uh, one additional issue. So opening data is one thing, and uh, making that data uh, ready to be used by other is another. So yes. in, in most case, government data uh, is, uh, is not ready to be used by others. So. So data is uh, imperfect and the quality is very low. So the quality is enough for internal use, but uh, the government data quality is uh, low when someone else uh, try to use it for other purposes. So um, in many cases, government receive uh, complaints uh, from especially a, a company that 
we cannot use the, such a low quality data. Yes. So, uh, so government should uh, improve that data. So spend your money. But uh, <laughs> so it is a difficult thing. Uh, so that is just my uh, small Th comment. Those are, those are excellent points. And I'll just comment on the last one. You know, um, I, I think the two questions are linked. We have a large amount of supply of open data today. Not as much as we think we need, as my article indicates, but we have a lot out there that's not being used. Demand is still very low on the part of the people. And I think a critical component of that is that government itself is not using its own open data. And the public has a hard time understanding how the open data should be used if the government itself isn't relying on the open data that it publishes. And I think there's a sort of, um, we often spend time focusing on how to encourage the public to use more government open data, how to increase demand for the supply. But I think governments should be looking at this open data resource and, and realizing that it's a way of overcoming data sharing problems within government. Because when it's published in the open, you don't need permission to use it. You don't need permission to innovate with it. You don't have to ask the other department, could you publish this? It's out there. And so I think that what government should be doing is not only publishing open data, but looking at this resource as a way of understanding itself better by leveraging this information and demonstrating to the public how it's leveraging this information. And that demonstration, I think, will encourage more open data consumption on the part of the public. Um, it's, in a sense, a uh, follow-up uh, question and a comment, as well as uh, an observation. Uh, you know, uh, Steve mentioned that in the Africa Open Data Jam, yes. uh, you had all these people there, and you had a problem, but the data wasn't there. Yes. Uh, but uh, what about the reverse uh, situation where all the data is some, somewhere out there, but uh, uh, as you say, you know, either it's not refined or the people don't know what to do with that uh, data. And in fact, I think this is the, the real uh, uh, issue with uh, open data. You might have all these uh, big data sets but uh, where do you get the insights if you don't have an immediate problem confronting you like Ebola? Uh, uh, where do you have that insight to decide how to use these data sets for something that uh, could be useful? And again, it's not just one data set, there may be several data sets. How do you combine these data sets to produce something that uh, could be uh, potentially uh, useful, and I think these are non-trivial problems mm -hmm. because it's also all raw data in a in a way. Mm -hmm. And so, where does the inspiration, where does the insight uh, come from? Uh, so, in a sense, that is the issue, and that is also a question. Perhaps some of the more experienced people might have some uh, uh, comments and observations on this. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Stephen, and then Eric. Uh, well, a follow-up on that. And, uh, one of the lessons that Mike Flowers, who was Bloomberg's chief analytics officer, keeps hammering home to us in CUSP is that it's not enough to have the data. You really have to know how it was generated, the practices of the police, for example, if it's a crime data set, the fire folks or whatever. And, and so while it's wonderful to have all this data out there, uh, the, the corollary that you need to make it really useful is is how did it get generated and what are the practices that uh, gave rise to it yes those are both good points i agree uh yeah. just um probably answering your question and i don't have a full answer but um in my experience uh, that's one of the challenges that we're facing in ogp when uh, we start you know sharing best practices among countries and regions. Uh, but one thing that I, it's working is when, um, it's probably government more led, but could be also from the civil society, is when you find a challenge or a problem. In the case of Ebola, I think it was fantastic the way that uh, you did it. Because, the, and, and, and uh, good examples are in the Philippines, for example, with the typhoon with the uh, Sylvia Typhoon, right? So the government puts a challenge. Uh, 
I, I need information. Uh, I do a hackathon, but not a, normal, not a normal hackathon, you know, do whatever you want. No, no, no. We have this problem right now here. So we need to bring, you know, bright people, bright minds, young people, not that young, to, 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 to put us, you know, uh, here's the data sets that I have. Now, what are you going to do with it? It's your creativity. But you have to put the carrot. You need to put, you know, the challenge there. Spell it out, spell it out clearly so you can really get some good insights from, from what you expected as a problem. Yeah, I would, I would just uh, echo that, Eric. What, what we put out a press release about our work with the government of Sierra Leone. I think it was October 23rd. And you know, it just reminds you all ideas are derivative works today. As soon as we put out a press release announcing that we were doing all this work, you know, everybody stepped up and said, that's a great idea, we'll copy it. And I think that's wonderful because lots of other organizations said, look what IBM did. Let's do the same thing, but let's beat them. Let's do it better. Let's, you know, let's build a better repository. Let's work with a different government. Let's try it a different way. And before you know it, there were 10 other open data repositories focusing on Ebola. And that's a fantastic outcome. We're, de we're delighted that we inspired that work. And I think that's what happens with open data. One group innovates. They announce their innovation. Lots of other people are watching. And they copy that work, and they improve upon it. And it goes through a process, and it keeps on getting better. And that's, I think, a really valuable opportunity for civil society to take advantage of government data to improve services in new ways. Hey, Jacqueline and then Brian. Thank you. Um, I have a question with regards to the economic impact of open data, because this is something that's been on my mind for some time. I'm a champion of the open data movement here. I mean, we own data.gov.sg. We hope you like it, and if you don't, give us your comments. Um, we have 8,600 open data sets on it, and of Great. course I've seen companies that have been formed as a result of this, but not many. And then having gone to various places in the world where there are also active open data movements, um, I keep asking this question. So we say there's a potential increase in growth or a t potential GDP increase um, uh, from doing this, um, but no one's been able to show us an empirical <laughs> result that actually yeah. open data creates value that is you know, economic value that can be measured. Do you have any response to this? Because I've n not been able to get something out you know, I do. Many um, situations. I can offer you two uh, responses. The first is the very first story that inspired me to get involved in open data, which is the city of Vienna. Um, I was participating in a conference at City Hall in Vienna a couple of years ago, and I heard the CIO from the city describe their open data journey. Um, they decided to uh, take a very strategic approach to open data. Rather than publish first and see who would use it, they reached out to their ISV ecosystem around the city and said, we have this data. We have traffic, we have weather, we have uh, economic data. What could you use? What would you like us to publish? And they held a whole variety of town hall meetings for a year with ISVs and corporations trying to match up economic potential for use of the data. Not thinking to charge for the data. The city was not interested in charging because the city said, you know, the public has already paid us for this data through taxes. It would not be fair to double tax them by charging them again. We're not interested in that. We're interested in measuring the economic output of the data through jobs created and tax revenues generated. And so they not only asked which companies could use the data, they then started to monitor the companies that were using the data to track how many new jobs were created because the companies were able to grow by providing e products, software products, using the data. And then they tracked how much additional incremental tax revenue was generated by the new jobs and the new economic growth. Now, that doesn't require monitoring specific data use because they identified that to begin with. Another uh, example that Steve Koonin might be familiar with, New York City has uh, a startup incubator, uh, the Polytech set up with the Bloomberg administration five years ago. 
It's a very unique startup incubator. You know, there are lots of incubators around the world, and oftentimes they're started by former entrepreneurs who take an equity stake in the company and help them grow. In New York's case, they decided, we are only interested in creating new jobs in our city. Mayor Bloomberg set up this incubator in two locations, one in Brooklyn and one on 137 Varick Street, staffing it with students, graduate students from New York, from NYU, free labor, for the purpose of getting these companies to be successful, incubating them for, for between 12 and 24 months, lining up venture capitalists that the mayor was friends with, so we had that kind of as an advantage. Um, but he lined up this venture capital community to provide seed financing for viable startups. This program has been running with a 90% success rate, which is a remarkable success rate for incubators and has produced something over 5,000 new jobs for New York City in the open data space. That has coincided with our big apps competition, which creates a financial incentive for startups to create um, applications using open data, which might then become incubated by the incubator. So those are two statistics. Then the last one I'll tell you is this little number here, 2% GDP growth. That comes from the US Commerce Department's Bureau of Economic Analysis. BEA, which did an analysis based upon how many data sets NOAA, National Weather Service, Patent Office, and the Census Bureau, three big components of the Commerce Department, have but have not published, and what the economic impact of that data could be on the U.S. economy if they could get it all out there. It's not too bad. Steve, two somewhat unrelated questions, if I may. First one, actually, I think follows on from what you've just said. And that is, in putting together data sets and inferring things from them, you create new data sets. That's right. And once you've done that a lot of times, you've got a whole new set of data sets, which you then want to look at and see what you can infer from the joins of those data sets. When they have been open in the first place, should that next set be open as well? And if not, why not? What's the business model that works for all of that hierarchy of business sets? As open becomes big, in a whole range of different scales, as I was saying yesterday, what's that going to look like in terms of the ethics of it being open versus the economics and the business model of delivering revenue and jobs? First question. Second oh. question, if I may, while you think about that one, the second one's easier, is Good. it won't have escaped anyone's attention that there are only two women sitting around this top table. Yeah. Have you, in your work, discovered that there's an attitude to what you can derive from open data sets, which is any way gender biased? <laughs> can I take the first one first? Um, we've had a discussion about this in New York uh, because um, some members of the New York te tech community have asked the city uh, to publish the logs of data usage of their open data repository, um, which is uh, there's the assertion that who uses open data should itself be public. And I have argued that I don't believe that that should ever be public and that cities should not retain it for more than 30 or 60 days because we don't want to become a society that tracks our data usage because that information could be used for political purposes and in the United States that can lead to ugly repercussions. So, but we're having that debate today about uh, what is the public interest in log data and in metadata? And when does the public interest um, lead to undesirable outcomes? And I, I think that that is a, a discussion that we don't have firm answers on yet and we have to continue to discuss. On gender equality, I mean, that's a really, personally, that's an extremely important issue to me. I'm married to a Danish woman, and uh, as many of you know, um, in Denmark, 50% of the parliament is women, and gender equality is just an important part of their culture, and so in my household, it's a very important part of our culture. Um, and, uh, but I don't have an answer about uh, that. I will say that this is a unique audience, and many of the audiences that I address, uh, the, the ratio is uh, far closer to equal. So I, it, I think it's just probably circumstance today that it, that it ended up this way, and I'm sure that in many other discussions is a more equal distribution. 
Dr. Chen, you wanted to, to come in? Okay, so uh, this is a refer to Peter's question, how we can choose relevant data, how you can get insight from data. Uh, I can share some of my experience. So first of all, um, we have to learn from existing literature. We know traffic data is relevant f uh, to air quality. This has been proved by environmental theory. So the second way is we, sometimes we need to have common sense. We have some insight here as a data scientist. We, we think about something could be relevant. I'm not sure whether it's, it's true or not. For example, I know I could think about human mobility data might be relevant to noise. Later, we check it. We check with some uh, relevance metrics, so the Pearson correlation, we put those some, some series together. We check it. We, we found it's related. The check-in pattern of people in New York City is quite relevant to the 311 complaint in a place. So we have some metrics we can check. And later, you have a second check. After adding a part of data, that's really it bring you at once a new uh, increase of performance. So we have to make sure when adding additional data source, we have get additional improvement of the performance. Otherwise, we should not use this data. So I'd like to, I, maybe we should not profile data scientists as a guy who can play with a, a list of tool, existing tools. A data scientist should have insight about the data. That's the reason why I say we might need less domain knowledge, but need more knowledge about data, about the about data itself and the data scientist. So that's my experience. Right. Thank you. Maybe uh, Heng Chi, you will have the last word before we break off. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it has to do with uh, economic performance and open data. <clears throat> the uh, you know, you said that this 2% growth that uh, to the national economic performance is really just an expectation, it's not being measured yet, and you don't know if it's been fulfilled. Jackie asked a question, you know, how would she know? You have this open data. Now, it's a very important question for Singapore, because in Singapore, everything must be measured. Mm -hmm. And you put in research money by a certain time frame, the funders want results, you know. So if you put out open data, you know, would you say in your experience, um, you know, you shouldn't expect results immediately, but what sort of time frame would be a good time to see some results come back? Because I think that will be quite persuasive to authorities here to, you know, let go of data. You know, I. I I think there are some, some very, um, there are some concrete ways that we can measure the economic value of open data. Um, I don't know if I'm going to publish them right now in front of Microsoft, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, but there are some, uh, yeah, you know, there there are some there are some ways that you can measure the economic value. You can look at your current baseline growth and. You can measure the number of communities that pick up the data. You know, part of the challenge is that we sort of have a field of dreams expectation about open data. We'll just publish it and people will come. And it isn't quite like that. We still have to set an example. You know, there's a fear on the part of the population of, well, can I use it? What can I use it for? What do I do with it? Uh, there's a skilled challenge that we have. Uh, how many skilled resources do we have that can take advantage of it? How do we empower those skills? But after you go through that, that set of, uh, of activities, and you understand that you're publishing good data, not just Freedom of Information Act requests that we're now finding a way of publishing or, or things we publish in other forms in the past that we're putting out there in open data format, but rather that we are identifying, we understand that the data we're publishing really does have an economic potential. So for example, uh, uh, in the United States, um, we're publishing um, satellite data with spectral analysis on crop yields. And that has real significant economic data value, not just the United States spectral analysis of crop yields, but all over the globe. We've got satellite photos from every piece of arable land on the planet. And if you go on to data.gov, you can find a satellite image from your neighborhood which has a spectral analysis of which crops are growing. And for lots of economies around the world, that's extremely valuable data. 
because they don't have agricultural statistics about their yields, about their, about their production. So if you look at data like that, or land use data, or oil leasing rights, or other types of, or permit data, uh, I don't think it's too difficult on a data set by data set basis for figuring out economic impact analysis. If you're going to try to come up with a grand kind of formula for all the data, that's going to be a long time. But for specific data sets, I think we can do it today. And I don't think the turnaround time is very long at all. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, on you. that note, um, maybe we should uh, have our coffee break and uh, be back by 4 o'clock.